Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to our talk on international work and the doctrine of discovery. Tonight, I am honored to be joined by my brilliant indigenous sisters and brother, Evie, Tina, and Tupac. I want to apologize to them because last yesterday, unfortunately, I couldn't get on with you all as um, we had a death in our family. So I apologize for that, but I love seeing your beautiful faces as I've missed you all very much. As I was preparing for this evening's discussion, I pondered on how best to convey the challenges we face because of the doctrine of discovery. Better said by my friend Steve Newcomb, the doctrine of domination. This code of, of domination has plagued us for over 500 years. And I reflect on the efforts made by our Haudenosaunee ancestors and our elders for us to have a voice in that fora first at the League of Nations and then later at the United Nations. Cayuga Chief Descahe traveled to Geneva in 1923 to address the League of Nations about the right of his people to live freely on their own lands, practice their own religion and follow their own laws. And the door was shut in his face by what he called cruel indifference. Upon his return, Descahe was never allowed back across the imposed border to his home in Six Nations, Ontario, Canada. Chief Descahe lived the rest of his life in Buffalo, New York, forever separated from his family. Finally, in 1972, thanks to the efforts of our leader, we were allowed back in the United Nations and we thought eventually we would have a place at the table. So then I started thinking about the politics of the United Nations and the domestication of our inherent rights is what we see is happening now. This vast institution not designed by us for us, so of course it would never fulfill its own initial purpose, which was the maintenance of international peace and security. In 1948, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights was proclaimed. And I think that articles one and two are of particular importance, so if you'll bear with me, I'd like to read them to you. Article one. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Article two, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Furthermore, no distinction shall be made on the basis of the political, jurisdictional, or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it is independent, trust, non-self-governing, or under any other limitation of sovereignty. So then, if this universal declaration exists, why would we need a special form for indigenous peoples, the one that we've attended for the past 18 years? <clears throat> well, it's because of the doctrine of domination. We are still not seen as human, equal to other humans. Why? Because it serves a purpose to continue to deny our existence as equal, therefore our rights. And as Tupac always reminds us, the territorial integrity of Mother Earth doesn't matter as well. It gives governments the right to continue to strip our mother of her precious resources. And when we defend her, we are attacked, jailed, maimed, raped, and murdered, sending us fleeing for our lives to other parts of Mother Earth. And what are we met with when we get there? Well, we are not met with care, as is our custom as Haudenosaunee people. We are put in cages, confined, separated from our families, and denied basic human rights, all for a situation that we didn't create. Why has this travesty been ignored? Are these really the teachings of your people? So I ask all of you listening tonight, where is the morality, civility, and humanity that we always hear about? I wanna remind everyone that our souls are not the ones that need to be saved. There are laws on the books against all of these things, except when it pertains to our people. Then you look to us and ask, what are our next steps? What can we do? Well, part of the problem is that while people are benefiting from these atrocities, they're not exactly inspired to change them. We didn't create this problem, so it's not ours to fix. We can only try to educate those who want to learn. 
we as Indigenous peoples will continue to work together as there is strength in our unity and our closeness. I hope that one of the takeaways from this conference is that everything is connected. We as a peoples will never realize peace without a proper relationship with the natural world. Mother Earth is not a commodity. As my Aunt Tanya always said, she's a relative, not a resource. We are not better than all other living beings. We are equal to them. The birds, the trees, the medicines, plants, animals, waters, and insects. We all just have different responsibilities. So I hope you leave this conference and think about what are your responsibilities to our mother and to each other and all other living beings. Lastly, I wanted to share this belt with you, the one dish, one spoon belt. It's the oldest belt we have. And the great law of peace stated that it will turn out well for us to do this. We will say, we promise to have only one dish among us and it will be beaver tail and no knife will be there. We will have one dish, which means that we will have all equal shares of the game roaming about in the hunting grounds and fields. And then everything will become peaceful among all of the people. This belt was an instruction that we would share equally. The dish is the world and we all share the spoon. As Orrin Lyons always says, if we can instruct people to do that, over seven and a half billion people to share, then it's been well worth it. So thank you for sharing. I'm looking forward to hearing from my indigenous sisters and brother, um, so I'm going to turn it to them. Ika English. My name is Ivrea Zagiri. I am Iskaloteca Mexica Azteca. I want to thank Phil and Sandy Indigenous Values Initiative, Ayla, and all of the amazing staff that they have uh, that has been working tirelessly to bring together this historic event. It is just remarkable. Um, looking at how things are in this time right now, it's, it's amazing that we're still able to connect and uh, communicate and educate each other on such an important issue and, and how uh, and where we're at right now in this moment in time and how it's all connected. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of update in, in, it, it, uh, in the work that we've been doing, not just internationally, but also on a local community level. Um, I think as indigenous peoples, we understand that while this panel is to talk about the international work, we can't really do international work without doing community work as well. Um, they're very much intertwined and they're very much connected. Um, and so in, in responding to what some of the questions have come across in terms of what the next steps are or what the next steps could be for, for some people in their own respective communities, I wanted to share a little bit um, about the history of what work we've been doing in our own community. Um, as, as was mentioned in 2009, um, my dear sister and mentor, Tanya Ganella Fishner was tasked with um, writing the preliminary study on the doctrine of discovery. Um, and along with our brother, Steve Newcomb, who many of you have seen uh, at, at, in the previous webinar. Um, and, and this work was very important. It was very important because it was a momentous time for people to really understand the impacts of the doctrine of discovery. And while it's, it was just a preliminary study, we're still working to get a full study done on the doctrine of discovery and the effects it's had on indigenous communities. Um, in 2012, Donatiera, my organization, um, we organized a spiritual run. We ran 120 miles from Phoenix to Tucson, I'm sorry, from Tucson to Phoenix to demand that the Arizona Department of Education um, include the preliminary study on the doctrine of discovery into the soul studies curriculums here in the state of Arizona. That same year in 2012, we hosted an Indigenous Peoples Forum on the Doctrine of Discovery at the Arizona State Capitol. In 2013, we organized a Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery conference in partnership with Arizona State University, where we had over 430 Indigenous pe Peoples representatives globally. In 2017, our organization created an Educators Alliance. 
And this Educators Alliance has continued the work around education and the doctrine of discovery. From 2012 to current, we have been include we have worked on various workshops we've done panels we've done events um, mostly to youth and college students um, who wanted information on the doctrine of discovery um, and the educators alliance also just recently um, in june decided that it was time to educate other educators within their school systems on the doctrine of discovery. So they organized um, meetings with their colleagues to educate their educators on the doctrine of discovery. And I feel like this is a really important point to mention because um, we're not waiting for the Arizona Department of Education to put the doctrine of discovery into the educational system here in Arizona. We're taking it upon ourselves. We're organizing within our own communities to do the work that the, that the school system should be doing. Um, and just recently in July of this year, last month, uh, the Educators Alliance hosted an online webinar for the youth in our community on the doctrine of discovery. So, these are some of the things that we've been working on here locally in Arizona and in the community that we're from. Um, and we, we encourage and we ask and we hope that those who want to do something um, can, can step up and, and try to organize something in their own communities. We want to move away from educating people on the doctrine of discovery into dismantling the doctrine of discovery. We recognize that um, everything is intertwined. The history of the doctrine starts with the colonization and it, it brings us to this very moment um, where we're all, instead of sitting in the same room together to discuss this, we're all sitting in virtual rooms because of the pandemic. Um, we talked about how indigenous peoples uh, have been experiencing this pandemic for over 500 years. And so I feel like it is our responsibility to educate our youth and our children because I feel like they are the ones who are gonna carry that work. We have to recognize and understand and remember that they are the future leaders. And when they understand the history, um, I think that change will come change will come. Um, and as a mother and a grandmother, it's my responsibility to educate my own family and uh, as much as I can um, on this important issue. Um, and, and it's something that I can't depend on a, a school system to do or anyone else. It's something that we as Indigenous people have the responsibility uh, to do. So I want to thank you all again for participating in this important event and I also again want to thank Betty and and Phil and Sandy for um, bringing us all together to discuss such an important topic. Ayo, thank you. Good afternoon, good evening, good day. Uh, as it may be, I don't know what time it is over there with Tina and Gata over there in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But uh, what we would say today is a good greeting to each and every and all. Nekane no toka, tupak, rika costa. Yao tashkal, katoka, naokaris karotekpa. I'm speaking to you today, once again, I'm sure it, uh, we can, everybody can hear me, you know, Adam? Okay. I wanted to first of all acknowledge um, the request that was made and that our conference uh, virtual webinar conference conveners uh, communicated to all of our participants today about uh, arriving at this moment uh, with uh, containers of, of, of the water, of the circuit water. And just to background a little bit of why that request was made and how it was made is that if you're here now, you can hear me now, even if you can see me now, or you can sense that we're taking the intention to communicate with each other, then you yourself are a container of water as a being of this planet, as a human being. 
your container of water, your gourd of water. If you notice, whenever the rain was falling, we asked the sister about the water that's here today from the river Jordan. It's, 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 in, this, it's in the vicinity. It's in the, it's, in the, it's in the realm of what we're communicating with because water itself is the medium of communication of the spirit of life on this planet. It's the total antithesis of the system of domination that we've been addressing, of which the doctrine of discovery is an instrumentality. You know? The colonization is 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 a is a is a, a aftermath, no? And the genocide is the effect. But the true dire consequences of that system of domination and not just genocide, not just colonization of the indigenous peoples, the dire effect of that system of domination is to accomplish the terror side of Mother Earth. What did I just say? I said the terror side of Mother Earth. The deliberate, intentional actions that are bringing about the, 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 the capacity, destruction of the capacity of Earth, not just Earth, Mother Earth, to be the mother to the future generation. That's an international crime against life on this planet. The sad fact, as Barry mentioned, the designation, the articulation of that international convention on the crime of terror side, it's not going to come out of the UN because that system itself is built off of that system of domination of the states. I say that because this is one of the things that we learned. We heard Betty speaking about this Kahn when he traveled through the League of Nations, no? In the in a, in a century past, no? In a time past. But we in our tradition of this Kaloteka, we also have a memory we're talking about our history. We can't put together a history unless we have a way to connect our memories. And that's what this water does. In this water, there's an ancestral memory of life on the planet. It's right there. And the motions of the, of the water are on the, with the, with the gores of Mother Earth. In other words, the water, I wouldn't say watersheds, they gores of Mother Earth. They call it watersheds, but it's really their containers. And each one of these containers that we call close to each other to have life on a daily basis. It's a part of one gourd, what they say, the bowl. The Onondaga, the Onondaga, they call it the bowl. We call it the shikali. This is it. What they call the bowl, this is what we call it. The, the komi, the shikali, you know? And as you can see, there's a no other than one over there. And that bowl over there is a bowl of fire. This is the bowl of water. The bowl of fire and the bowl of water, when they come together, that's us. That's us, that's who we are, what we are, where we are, and also when we are, which is now. So accordingly, as how Betty Lyon have said, the system has been very effective in discombobulating and disorientating, literally disorientating. Now everybody, when they have a map, they look to the North Star. They look to the navigators of Christopher Columbus to put their geographies, and also what do they do? If you look, I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm trying to put down a, a signal. If you look to the methodology that we put in place, Evie said that we hosted a conference. Jake was there. We had Jake coming to talk to the high school youth at the high school that Evie's mentioning. Her kids were there. My grandsons were going to be listening to Jake Edwards at the high school talk about dismantling the doctrine of discovery. If anything happens after today, whenever you think about doctrine of discovery, don't let it come in here without putting first dismantling. There has to be a predicate to this concept. We can't just say, oh, dismantling Christopher, no, no. Dismantling the doctrine, that's the predicate to this concept from here on. Otherwise, we're just exchanging information, but we're not enhancing our consciousness and we're not formulating the cognition that is necessary to actually accomplish the dismantling because it's basically an issue of cognition. The fundamental issue is cognition. That's why we ask for the water. That's why the fire is here. Because based on those systems of cognition, of what we are, who we are, when we are, and how we should be with each other, that's going to give us the solution. Literally, this is a solution. That's a solution right there. And when it's in balance with this and with that, that's, that's what we're talking about. That's not domination. That's life the way it's supposed to be, with that bowl and that integrity. They call it the one spoon. We call it the territorial integrity of Mother Earth. I'm going to say it one more time. Because when Orrin Lyon started this conference the first day, he said there's 
After a lot of meetings, the indigenous meeting, days and days and days of discussion, communicating, they came up with four words after that meeting. He mentioned it at the beginning. In order to go forwards, from now, we're saying this, four words. Territorial. Integrity of Mother Earth. You can see this one is well oriented. It's not to the north. Why do you say that? Because, and I know my time is short. I'm going to cut it short. Uh, why do we say that? Because the system that has been formulated by the system of global domination has a name. Ask Steve Bannon. He champions it all the time. It's called the system of state sovereignty. After the fall of the Roman Empire, after the Dark Ages, when the mercantile class started to achieve ascendancy, they said, well, we're not going to have a kingdom more, but we got to have somebody, a chair is still there. Who's going to sit there? They put the concept of sovereignty on the state, and they created the Westphalian system of state sovereignty. That's what the UN is. They did that in Westphalia in 1648. No? And in all this conversation that we have had, that's the territorial domain that you see when you see the map of the United Nations, state sovereignty, what we had to fight when we pushed against it in the formulation of the declaration. And when they push back, they try to make sure that the concept of territorial integrity of the state stayed implicit in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. To get beyond that, the solution is to come back to the territorial integrity of Mother Earth and push forward from there. That's at this level of geography territoriality. It must be also recognized that beyond the territorial domination system, they have also instituted a temporal system of domination. What time is it? Says who? You look at the map of the UN, you see that the designation of the east, west, and north, south, that goes right through Greenwich. Tina, you're probably on the other side, huh? I think you might be listening. But what we're trying to say is that there are other organic, not mechanical systems, not of time keeping, but of time sharing. Another system of cognition of humanity was integral and in integrity with our relationship with the watersheds, not just of our particular territories, but the whole planet. That's where we're going to emerge. What I said, that's where we're going to emerge. At some generation, if we're still around, if we get beyond this pandemic and this climate crisis, at some point, those future generations are going to emerge once again from this, from this. It's going to be there. It's going to be then. So we keep that in mind when we speak. Last point. It has been left out of the conversation, understandably, but it should be critically addressed. When we speak of the Johnson versus McIntosh decision in the year 1823, no? Was that the year 1823? That same year, they took that Johnson versus McIntosh decision with the Monroe Doctrine and they expanded it continentally, no? It's no longer the Pope. It's no longer uh, uh, the, the, the Vatican. It's not longer the King of Spain or Portugal. It became Uncle Sam. He took control of the Doctrine of Discovery in this continent. And since then, he's been sitting on top of that pile, no? But what is known as the concept of the Americas, which right, is wrong. So I'm going to close right there by asking you all a question. Did you guys see the Mueller report? The Mueller report, did you see that? Did you read it? I'm not talking about the Mueller report of this Trumpster. I'm talking about the original Mueller, Martin Basdi Mueller. He's the guy who created the concept of America and this document, which is the first time that the name America was put on a continent to the west of Europe. He put it out in the year 1507 and he immediately took it back because he found out he was wrong, you know? America is a mistake. Even the guy who came up with the name identified that. The point I'm making is that there's different systems of cognition, geographic, temporal, spiritual, that we're trying to make access to through the technology of this so-called modern um, digital age. But I'm telling you, that's a digit. That's digital science right there. When you put this together with this, and realize it all comes from me here, and it makes the connection with what's around us and, and, uh, and uh, before us, then we come to the same 
realization. He just said, we have the responsibility. But the responsibility that we have is because we have been given, gifted the ability by our Creator. We've been gifted the ability to remember, to have a memory, to know who we are, to have a consciousness of the actual existence of life that we have, but we also have been given a will, a will to live. We have been given a mandate to live. We have been given a mandate to live, to breathe, to live. Based on that, based on that, based on that mandate, the mandate of the indigenous peoples to be part of life, to partake in life, to share in life, we're going to take this process forward. The dismantling of the doctrine of discovery is one part of it. But ultimately, as Evie said, as, as Betty says, it has to do with our relationship with this gourd of water, which is our Mother Earth. The gourd of water, which is our Mother Earth. And the integrity of water, earth, wind, and fire, which is what and who we are. And bring that forward in our own agenda, of our own making, not in the calendar system of Rome, but in our own making. And that's taking place. With that, I will close and uh, leave it open for questions and comments and pass it on back to the moderators. Thank you so much for your kind <clears throat> attention and patience. Right, Tina? Tēnā koe tu, Pak, o tira tēnā koutou katoa akunui, akurahi, ko tēnā ngā tatoku ingoa, heuri tēnei, nō roto te taira whi tino reira, ko hikirangi te maunga, ko waiapu te awa, ko ngā te purai te iwi. Um, kia ora, mai tātai katoa, my name is Tina Ngata. I am a Ngāti Poroi woman from Te Taira Whiti, the East Cape of Te Ika Māwi, also called the North Island um, of New Zealand. And um, I am uh, Tangata Whenua, we are people of the land, uh, but we are also uh, people of the waters, people of the ocean. And I just thank you, I wanted to thank you, Phil, for reminding everybody to have some drinking water because we're going to have a drink very soon together. So have some drinking water handy. Um, yeah, as an, as an ocean woman, and, and when I say that, I mean I come from an ocean nation, but also I am a descendant of the ocean. The ocean is my ancestor, and I can name my genealogical uh, layers going all the way back to my ancestor ocean. Um, and just like all of my ancestors, I carry my ancestors in my blood, uh, just like I carry my ocean ancestor in my blood. And so that's the space I'm going to be speaking to today. Uh, but first, I wanted to acknowledge uh, the Haudenosaunee people uh, who have, um, you know, opened the space for us and helped us to carry our voices to each other and the organizers and Isla. Thank you so much. You've done an amazing job helping us to join our voices on this really vital issue. Um, and I wanted to acknowledge my Indigenous brothers and sisters um, and, and Tupac, fantastic to see you again. Betty, Evie, I miss you all in my heart. It's hard not being able to see you uh, the way that we do um, from time to time. And so, um, and, and all of those who have spoken in this event and provided testimony and inspiration to the ways that we as Indigenous peoples are standing up to and confronting and dismantling doctrines of domination every day. Um, and so I, I also, also before I get into it, I wanted to um, acknowledge Betty, your loss um, and send our love to you and your family, your family at this time. Um, and, and also to our sister Beverly for the loss that her family uh, have experienced. Um, and yes, te tika metuku, metuku aroha ki a rātou, ko whetirangitia, uh, to their loved ones who have started their journey back to the ancestors, um, just sending our love to them. O reira rātou ki a rātou, ko whetirangitia, tātou ki a tātou, te hunga ora ki te hunga ora, tēnā ka tātou katoa. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, I asked for people to have some drinking water nearby because we're going to make an offering to ourselves, to our bodies, an acknowledgement that our bodies are planets and the planet is connected to us, that we are one and the same. And, um, and so in drinking this water and taking a sip, as we're all going to do just now, we're going to recognize that 
not just as a drink, not just as a sip, but as an offering of water to our bodies. Cheers. Now, as that water makes its way down your throat and into your body, as it moves past into your chest, I just want us to consciously acknowledge the cooling, life-giving medicine as she passes down into our body, bringing life and refreshing us. She cleanses us. She helps our kidneys to rid our bodies of toxins. How amazing is water when we drink her in? The way in which she helps our blood to carry the oxygen around our body. I'm going to speak a little bit about what a sacred role that is in our bodies because for us in Tao Māori, well, for my learnings, before there was land, there was water. There was only the water and the sky. Wai nui a tea, the great expanse of water. And this is where love began because what greater expression of love is there than to give life? And we are all saline with every living moment that we breathe in our sky father and then through our lungs he once again embraces our earth mother that he was separated from and the positive and negative spaces come together in the oxygenation of our blood and they reunite in the center of our beings it's an act of constant creation and maintenance of life that manifests with every breath that we take. And all of this magic is taking place in water. We, as Tupac said, we are water beings. Our bodies are 60% water. Our hearts are nearly 80% water. And the water carries the sacred union of sky father and earth mother through our bodies. And that watery magic is happening right now within you and within me, a sacred creation of life, a union of gods reconnected by the water that we just drank. And water has always been a connector. Colonizers apportioned ownership and allow people to lay claim and to separate the rivers from the oceans and used water to dispossess and divide and displace. And just as the papal bull Romanus Pontifex said, you may possess and, uh, and own these islands, these lands, these harbors, these seas but that my indigenous brothers and sisters that is not the intrinsic state of water her intrinsic state and intention is to nourish and bear life and she is patient and she has memory she is intelligent and she finds a way and she is us so just as water carries ancestral memory so too do we carry the memory of water in us. And right now, that water that's sitting in our bellies is resonating with the water in our system. And when we lay in water and when we play in water and when we float and we bathe in water, she speaks to us. She speaks to the water in our systems and they remember each other. She loves us and she's just waiting for enough of us to love her back. And so those of us who remember, we must love her fiercely. We must remember her and we must remember ourselves to her and we must reconnect her and we must reconnect to her. That is the truth that's sitting in our bellies right now a medicinal reminder of the love 
that our water mother has for all of us. Tēnā koutou, kia ora mai tātou katoa. I'm going to ask our sister Evie to offer our water song now. Thank you. Thank you. Bless Okamati, our dear sister Tina. Um, I'm going to share a water song from our people. And uh, for those of you who attended uh, the, Disma the Doctrine of Discovery conference two years ago, um, we had a ceremony there on Adonga Lake, and I sang this song. Um, and so I'm going to ask that while I'm singing that you connect with that water that you take a drink or you put your hands in it. Um, because like my sister so graciously taught me yesterday, my sister Tina, um, she, she mentioned that water, the colonizers use water to divide us when indigenous peoples, we use the water to connect us. And so I thought that was a very beautiful and important thing that, that needs to be brought forward. Um, we all know that Water is life, but water is also medicine. And so I wanted to offer this song in honor of those loved ones that our dear sisters, Betty and Beverly have recently lost. I also would like to offer this song for our dear brother, Kevin Tarrant, who passed recently um, due to COVID. And Kevin was uh, a dear brother, a fellow singer uh, and and an ally in our work at the United Nations around indigenous peoples. And so I wanted to offer this song and, and to all the loved ones, all of our people, all of the people that we've lost recently in this time, um, I'm gonna offer you this song, this water song as, as, as a medicine. my beautiful dear sister Tina oh I miss you all so much I could just jump through the screen to hug you 
I'm not <laughs> choked up right now. Um, I want to go into a little um, discussion time. And I was hoping that, Tina, you could talk about um, a little bit of the work that's going on uh, recently in your community. Um, I've been following you on Facebook and watching um, your progression uh, of work that you're doing. And if you could share that with everyone. Sure. Sure. Thank you. Um, and thank you also, Evie, for that, for that beautiful medicine um, for us all. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the doctrine of discovery, um, similarly to many places, it hasn't um, really been a, a feature of education here in Aotearoa, New Zealand either for a long time. And of course, they, we all know that that's very purposeful. Right. And uh, I, you know, I only found out about it through my work when I went to the permanent forum and one of our, my, my mentor, Moana Jackson, was one of the speakers at the, um, at the permanent forum meeting on the doctrine of discovery. And so when I went there and I heard about what he had said and I read the work that had been produced in that previous meeting, I thought, this is, we need to be learning about this. Um, and, and at that time, as we were learning about it, New Zealand was preparing to roll out a $27 million nationwide celebration of the anniversary of the arrival of Cook. And uh, it was 250 years. And so we, that was probably about five years ago. Uh, I want to say five or six years ago. And so... Um, that, that they that I found out about it. The actual events took place last year, and so we spent quite a few years, myself and and some amazing supporters. Um, we spent quite a few years just trying to push out as much information as we could for people to understand the doctrine of discovery. Um, and you know, for most of us here in Aotearoa it was not acknowledged as being an issue for us. If, if anybody did hear about it, they thought that it was something that happened um, overseas, that it was something that Christopher Columbus did to other people. It didn't happen to us. And so there are all of these fictions um, that I know are also rolled out overseas, all of these fictions that were rolled out in response to the discussions that we were driving, such as, no, that didn't happen to us. Our colonization was a kind colonization or our colonization was invited and we benefited from it. Or, um, you know, it could have been so much worse if it was by at the hands of somebody else. Just all of these different um, fictions that, the colonial fictions. And so um, I wrote a series of, um, of essays that have since been published into a book called, um, called Kiamo, uh, Resisting Colonial Fictions. And it was just really to expose a lot of that colonial fiction and also for us to clearly see the mechanisms that are used by the state through these symbols of domination in our currency, in our statues, uh, the stories and the narratives and the heroicism that people carry out around colonization. So we carried that out, but also to, because I'm a, uh, I'm also an environmental researcher and worker and, um, and I work yeah. in uh, looking at ocean well-being as well. So looking at how these doctrines of domination are visited upon our environmental spaces to tell us, you know, colonial ideas like territory only ever means land, which erases oceanic territory. And for us as ocean people, we made families and fed from and nourished and traversed the oceans for thousands of years, and we still do. And those, uh, that oceanic territory was sliced up by the doctrine of discovery, and it's maintained in that space by uh, principles of the doctrine of discovery that are held within international law, like the Convention on the Law of the Seas. And these things have direct ramifications to uh, international law, uh, how we treat the high seas, who defines what the high seas are. Uh, and so we've been, uh, we've been also working at an international space to look at how international law impacts on our traditional oceanic territories. 
um, as well as working with other overseas interest groups, particularly in Europe and Britain, to look at how these, uh, these systems of domination are upheld through international organizations like the World Bank, World Trade Organization, and International Monetary Fund, who are founded from the process of the application of the doctrine of discovery and doctrine of domination and maintain economic domination through regulating world trade deals or free trade deals and um, and regulating world poverty, but doing that in a way that maintains this economic um, power in justice. So, um, so just constantly speaking those truths and speaking it in a myriad of ways through art, through poetry, through performance, and through sharing our stories with our other Indigenous brothers and sisters has been the main modes and through publishing as well has been the main modes. Um, but as Evie pointed out, also really keen to be moving towards a place of dismantling. So um, we just last week managed to get our local municipal council to agree to undertake an anti-racism journey, which will include understanding the role of the doctrine of discovery within local government. I don't want to take up too much time. I'm going to ramble and I really want to hear from our other brothers and sisters as well. But that's a lot of that we've been doing here in Aotearoa and in a regional space. I think that it's so important to understand like what's happening all over in our different communities, um, you know, and what we're doing, um, you know, as indigenous peoples, right? And how much work goes into that and how much we have to give every single time you know, I always think about, um, I always kind of visualize that like there's this plate and we have to serve ourselves up off of this plate for people to consume all the time in these discussions, you know, so that they may learn um, and it takes from us and then we have to go back to our mother and regain our strength um, every time. So um, I appreciate the work that you're doing in your territory. It's so it's so vital and so important and it's great. I wanna now ask Evie and Tupac to talk about, you know, what's happening in their community, um, in particular what's happening with, you know, the quote unquote immigration, right? I hate that word. Um, you know, these are sisters and brothers that are coming uh, to, to look for safety and help. And these are our original territories and and they're being treated so horrifically. And so I kind of wanted you to speak a little bit about that work and about the work of our sisters and brothers from the South and raise up their voices. Um, so <laughs> thank you again, um, Benny and Tina for your words. Um, I, I wanted to share a quote uh, and it, it very much goes to what Tina was talking about um you know in regards to the colonizers kind of trying to make it better for us or justifying colonization right um it's it was by a, a philosopher named will durant who was also a historian and it, the quote is a great civilization is not conquered from without until it has destroyed itself from within and um if you if you really deep you know look deep into that quote it's basically blaming ourselves, uh, blaming indigenous peoples, blaming, uh, you know, oppressed people for being conquered. Um, colonizers rarely take responsibility for their actions and somehow try to make it better. Um, it's no different in the current time right now with our brothers and sisters from the South. Um, there's, you know, there's no secret that there's a lot of corruption in the South and, and a lot of it comes from other indigenous peoples, you know, there are indigenous peoples that are in positions of leadership and that are corrupted by oppression and colonization and are forced, really forced into these positions where it is, uh, it is, a you where they're forced to choose between them or or their other people, you know, of, or people in their community. And, um, or, you know, there's a lot that goes along with that too. You know, there's poverty and there's greed. And um, unfortunately it's manifested 
uh, into something that is so horrific in the South that we, our brothers and sisters are literally fleeing for their lives. And, um, you know, it goes back to the pandemic of colonization. The displacement of, of the people in those territories. And the extraction of the resources that are in those territories. When you have people who are forced out of their homes, out of their lands, um, by government and even by so-called trade agreements that are to be better for economy and be better for these countries. And of course, you know, I'm going to NAFTA, USDA, you know, is what Trump is, is pushing. Thankfully, the TPP got cut off. <laughs> what Evie was talking about right now is she was giving some context to the experiences that we've had here. She and I, we both work out of our organization. Uh, Evie was giving some context to the experiences we've had. Go ahead, Evie, go ahead and finish. But just going back, you know, making that connection between the, the indigenous peoples that are being forced out of their territories when you have um, big corporations uh, that are selling grain and corn that is is been gen genetically modified um, at a cheaper price than what the farmers who have who have taken care of the land in 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 their terror in their respective territories um, you know when they're the price of the genetically modified version is cheaper and and you're you're struggling to feed your families you know there people are forced into um these situations and so people lose their land they lose their farms they lose their income uh the same thing with the coffee you know we're talking about uh large corporations and rich people that are really benefiting off of the back of indigenous peoples and while everybody likes to talk about immigration and and all of these horrible things that go along with it, no one ever wants to talk about the root cause. Um, the root cause of, of why people are coming in, in thousands at one time, uh, fleeing violence, fleeing uh, uh, drugs, fleeing all of these horrible, horrible things. Um, the fact that they're losing their homes and their lands. I mean, all of this, you know, they're children. They're children. Um, and, and that's you know, this is what the root cause of it all is, is colonization, the doctrine of discovery, um, the right for people to think that they have over other people's territories and lands and resources. And, and I know that our brothers and sisters in the North are also struggling with that um, up in, in what's called Canada. Um, you know, they are also suffering uh, from these trade agreements. And so it's, people don't wanna talk about the connection. Um, and I think it's important, you know, that all of that is entwined when we have these discussions on the doctrine of discovery, because, um, it didn't happen in the past. And, and I think, you know, and my indigenous brothers and sisters can, can attest to that. It's very frustrating when we hear, oh, it's all in the past. It happened so long ago. No, it's still happening now. It's still happening now. So um, I'm gonna let uh, my elder Tupac go ahead and, and follow up on that question. And, the, and Tina wanted to just interject something briefly too, just so you know Tupac. Where Tina? Oh, thank you, Tupac. Yeah, just to you know, um, and I we've we've spoken about this before, you and myself, Tupac, and and Evie around the roles of um, FTAs, free trade agreements, and and how it's really important for us to see how the doctrine of domination and doctrine of discovery is operating and functioning within those systems. Um, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but these global economic institutions of the World Trade Organization, World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, they, they are governed by, uh, by creditors, by state creditors, and so, which I also call state creditors. But the creditor creditors are the, the ones who can 
who can credit the most money into those organizations are the ones that have the strongest governing roles. And the vast majority of those states have that money by virtue of the doctrine of domination. So they, when they spread out, when they expanded their empires out into the world and set up these extractive, um, all these extractive processes where they took all of these resources out of these resource rich spaces and channeled the wealth to Europe, which is actually very resource poor. They created, you know, they, they filled their coffers with indigenous money. And that went straight into the formation of these international uh, monetary organizations. And even people like Joseph Stieglitz recognizes who is, was the ex vice president of the world bank recognizes the injustice in that so it's set up the system that is still operating today and the world that has generated world debt also the, the and these organizations still regulate world debt and global poverty um, and so the structural adjustment programs so once these systems of extraction and debt and the the way in which they would cripple the infrastructures of these countries uh, happen, happened and they created all of this unjust debt where people, where countries were having to try and pay interest on top of interest. Then they set up structural adjustment programs to help these, help these countries who they had extract, who had been extracted from. And those included deregulating environmental protections, allowing for foreign investment and essentially making the situation even worse. And all of that is an application of the doctrine of discovery still being maintained today by the same countries that went there with these papal bulls and this mandate to allow them to extract and use for their profit. Um, and, so, and so the free trade agreements discussion is very much rooted in the maintenance of the of, of the doctrine of discovery and um, and domination and you cannot allow these uh, inst international institutions to continue to regulate and moderate trade agreements between colonizing states if you're at all interested in dismantling the doctrine of discovery that was all I wanted to say over to you Tupac I'm going to emphasize that point that Tina just made because we're hearing this conversation and dismantling the doctrine of discovery. You know, it's a dehumanizing uh, pathogen. It's a psychological pathogen. Let's call it out. It's a pathology, psychological, geopolitical that delivers the injection, intellectual injection of supremacy, you know, cultural supremacy. But that cultural supremacy is based on a, on a, on a false reality that somehow you can create a society and uplift a society and, and um, privilege a society without being accountable to the earth, which you depend on to live. Mother Earth, you're going to kill Mother Earth in order to be privileged? You're not, how far are you going to get with that? That's a formula for disaster, and that's a doomed system. That system is doomed. It's doomed, all right? However, they you normalize that generation after generation, and that's why we're here on our side of the screen of the indigenous. We're trying to find out how many of the folks on the other side of that pathological system have figured it out from the inside and have understood that they're part of the system that's continuing to normalize that. And one of the clues to that is what Tina just said. All of us who are on this webinar, how many of us took a position on the most current version of the doctrine of discovery? I'm talking about the US-Mexico-Canada agreement. That just got passed this year. How many of us still up and say, hey, wait a minute, Pope Francis, wait a minute, uh, 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 because right after the, the, the Intercaritra Bull of 1493, the next year, they had to do the arrangement between Portugal and Spain. That's why they speak Portuguese in Brazil, because they had to cut up the pie in terms of the markets. The markets actually existed at that time and were dominated by the kingdoms. They're not dominated by the kingdoms anymore. They're dominated by the corporations, as Tina just said, the financial interests. No? She, said, she said the investors, but I heard the predators, right? To me, it's the same thing. The predators, right? It's a predatory psychology, right? And in the end, they're predatory even to their own future generations because they're killing 
again, terracite, mother earth. The point being that we have to actualize this conversation to the current context. And that means if we're against the doctrine of discovery and the papal bulls and the Johnson versus McIntosh decision of 1823, we have to criticize the Monroe Doctrine. We have to criticize the us mexico Canada agreement. And if you realize that that government that signed that agreement, the three governments that signed the agreement, what did they have to say about the right of indigenous peoples to free, prior, and informed consent? Indigenous peoples who are fighting to defend the territories of Mother Earth from Mexico to Canada. Just take that frame. And then when you look at it, you see, yes, 1823, the U.S. institutes the Doctrine of Discovery with the Johnson versus McIntosh decision, the Marshall Trilogy. In 1917, what did I say? In 1917, the government in Mexico did the same thing, not with a Supreme Court decision. They put it in under the Mexican Constitution, the Alexandrian Bulls, they're called in Mexico. They instituted that as the foundation for territorial sovereignty of the Mexican Republic based on the papal bulls, of, the same papal bullshit, no? You go to Guatemala, the same thing happened in 1821. You go to Columba in the, in the Constitution of Cucuta in 1821. The point being, Tanya put the study out there, the preliminary study on the doctrine of discovery, the impact of the doctrine of discovery, the preliminary study. It's supposed to go to a full study. It's been blocked at the UN since then by them, but not by us. Like Evie said, we've been doing it. We went to Mexico. We went to Colombia. We went to Chile. We went to Guatemala. We went... We've been up and down the continent putting together the di different components of what is going to be a continental study on the impact of the doctrine of discovery, not just in Canada and the U.S., in Mexico, but every single state by state. And that presentation at some point is going to coalesce, just like the study did in 2010, to the agenda of the international system, however it may exist at that time. But like Evie said, we're not waiting for them. The full, complete study on the dismantling of the doctrine of discovery, which is required, why? Why is that required? Why is it required? Because colonization is illegal. What did I say? Colonization <laughs> is illegal. It's illegal. It's been illegal since United Nations Resolution 1514 in December of 1960. It's illegal. So if you're a colonizing settler state, guess what? You're participating in an international crime. Hmm? Uh, organized, it's, they call the violence that people are fleeing from Honduras. Remember, the first caravan that headed north from Honduras, it happened on a Saturday. On Friday, the day before, the court case of Bertha Cáceres, the strongest fighter against the doctrine of discovery in Honduras, they assassinated her. And her lawyers who were taking her case forward in the legal system of Honduras, her lawyers were thrown out of the courtroom the Friday, the Saturday, the next day, the caravan comes north. There's no use fighting in the legal, there's no legal system here. Just gang warfare with the capitalist gang imposing their order. Colonization is the ultimate form of organized crime. Colonization is the ultimate form of organized crime. It's so well organized that it's invisible. You think it's just normal to be doing this to the indigenous people and get your piece of the American pie. Or I can say in Spanish, to pastel americano, no? El pastel americano. Too much said already? We'll close right there. Oh, it, it wasn't too, too much said. It was, it was what needed to be said. And, and what everybody needs to talk about. Tina, do you have a, something to interject? Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, and also add that we can create our own international systems. We are our own international system as well. You know, Tupac is just so, he's just said it so eloquently and so powerfully about the way in which they operate. And so they will continue to tell these lies and to try to hide you know, their, their roles, the crimes, the unlawfulness of colonization that they're carrying out as well, which is why it's so important for us to undertake our ceremonies, to speak our truths, to listen to our guts and our bodies and our indigenous selves. Otherwise, you know, because it's ubiquitous, right? this voice is everywhere. It's international, national, domestic, it's surrounding us all the time. And so it's so important for us to keep telling our truths and our ways and maintaining our ceremonies, but also for us to envision and forge a new international 
arrangement because this is another thing that the colonizer does. They try to restrict us and place us in these boxes where we belong. But, you know, we are an ocean nation and also we are an international indigenous village as well. So, you know, such a, I just wanted to point out such an important role for us to create a new international way of being and relating to each other and connecting. Um, our own international laws and expectations and requirements for how we interact with each other and with Papa Tuanuku, our Earth Mother, and our Sky Father, and so and water as well, um, and and that you know speaking those things into being, speaking those things into truth and living it and, and walking that truth is such an important part of this as well. So our collaboration, um, our, our indigenous collaboration and coming together like this is just so vital thank you it is and, and before we close um uh before i send it back to phil and sandy um i just want to say that you know the, the stronger we are together the more we work together um our indigenous nations and communities you know um <laughs> the more we can we can do um like tupac with the continental commission of Abiyala which is so important that we just maintain our strength as well. So thank you so much for your beautiful messages tonight.